I was recounting of how I was, when I was working at Richard Rogers, his kind of first rule of architecture was win the job. Um, because without the job, without the client, there is no architecture. Episode 128. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Now, there's one other thing I want to let you know about. If you listen to podcasts, make sure you go subscribe to ArchiSpeak. You can find it on iTunes or visit ArchiSpeakPodcast.com. ArchiSpeak is a casual conversation about all things architecture. Super entertaining podcast with a healthy dose of humor by my three friends, Cormac Phelan, Neil Pan, and Evan Troxell. When you head on over there, let them know you heard about it on Business of Architecture. Today's guest has an illustrious past, graduating from Cambridge University and the Bartlett School of Architecture. He's worked in the offices of world-renowned firms Grimshaw Architects and Richard Rogers in the UK. Ryan Willard is the director of the Thinking Hand Studio. Ryan reached out to me a few weeks ago with the idea of interviewing UK architects for the business of architecture. And I thought that was a great idea to get some fresh perspective here on the BOA show. And I think you'll really like what we have in store here. So Ryan is going to interview architects in the UK, and then we will be working those into the normal interview lineup here on BOA. So I think, once again, I think you're really going to like the variety and the perspective that Ryan is going to bring to the show. The business of architecture is much more than just my effort here in the podcast. This is a worldwide movement of heightening the awareness of the importance of business skills for architects around the world and educating the public about the value of architects and bringing the power back into the hands of architects to shape our cities, to shape our homes, to shape the places where we live and work. So you are a part of this, and this is your platform. So like Ryan, if you would like to contribute and you know that you have a message and you'd like to do some interviews or you have some content that you want to share with the world to contribute to this dialogue, just drop a note to me at enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. The following interview that you'll hear today is an informal conversation I had with Ryan, but it went so well that I thought you'd want to hear a little bit behind the scenes of what happens at Business of Architecture. So in this episode, Ryan and I discuss the weather in England, networking, how to target and find high-end clients who aren't shocked by expensive fees, selling architecture, and a lot more. So for for our listeners, I'm talking with Ryan Ryan Willard, uh, based out of the UK, uh, he's the owner of the Thinking Hand Studio, and we're just we're just chatting because um, we we may be working Ryan into the lineup of Business of Architecture as an interviewer. So um you know this is basically this episode I want to introduce Ryan to all of you guys, and um, you know let me know if you like him or not. Would you like <laughs> to see uh, uh, Ryan interviewing some some uh, some of the UK architects and European architects and thought leaders? I, I'm sure everyone's going to say yes. Excellent. No, I'm very, I'm very happy to be here talking with you. It's uh, very exciting. So, yeah, so let's just talk about, no, we don't really know what exactly is going to happen, Ryan, in terms of how the interviews are going to work out and how they're going to kind of work in the business of architecture podcast. You know, but what we'll start out doing is we'll, um, you know, as you record your interviews, we'll kind of slot those in. So some of the podcast interviews you're going to hear, you're going to hear Ryan talking and not me. And uh, I think it's really going to add a lot to the conversation. It's going to um, you know, take the focus off of Enoch because it's not just about me, it's about all of us architects. And so it's going to be really good to have Ryan on the show. Ryan's going to be good to have you. And then also to get that uh, more international perspective because I know that although I do have a lot of UK listeners, you know, a lot of the times the things that are happening in the States with some of my guests aren't really relevant and they think, you know what, things are a little bit different over here. So it'll mm. be really good to figure out how, the, uh, how that does with the old world. It's- it's, it's very interesting as well um, that the kind of the attitude in America towards business is uh, you guys are less ashamed of, of 
selling stuff. It's kind of more in your culture. It's more in your nature. And the British were very reserved. And particularly as a, in, in professional circles, particularly architects, were very kind of like, oh, I don't want to sell anything. Certainly not. No, we're not, going, we're not going to do that. Whereas in America, I'm always, you know, I love it. I love the directness of conversation and the business is more naturally interwoven with creative, creative fields. I'm sure it's not, you know, it's not all totally idyllic and this is my kind of uh, rose tinted glasses but um there is certainly the kind of the the culture in the states is something which for, personally for me i've always admired that kind of salesmanship is a little bit more um prevalent in creative industries well you know that's really interesting because the u.s we have a we have a very obviously a very strong heritage that goes back to the uk you know we still um, you know, my, my personal ancestors came from there. Of course, the United States is a mixing pot. We have influences from all over the world, which is great. Um, but at the same time, it's interesting to look at, and I was talking with another architect the other day about this. Um, you have the UK, you have the United States, and then you have Australia. So it's like, you know, the UK has a much longer history than we do in terms of Anglo-Saxon law. Um, you know, you look at Australia, they're a much newer nation than we are. Yeah. And so you go to Australia and, um, I was talking with this guy, Ryan, Ryan King, uh, who I may be having on the show sometime, but he was talking about how in, um, in Australia, the architecture firms are very much more kind of aggressive, um, very much more, less traditional and, uh, more progressive. You know, we were kind of talking about how you go to their websites and, you know, you look at the pictures of the principals and no one's smiling. All the pictures are black and white. They're just very cutting edge, very artsy. You yeah, know. very serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, a lot of smaller firms. So, you know, here in the States, we do have mid-sized firms. We do have large firms. Um, but over there in Australia, they seem to be more much, much more about, you know, um, being really scrappy, entrepreneurial. Yeah. You know? And so it's interesting because, of course, in the UK, I would – my my impression is that the entrepreneurial scene over there, and like you said, the business scene is much more reserved, uh, more conservative, and uh, the less so in the United States, and then even less so in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's a kind of uh, as a generalization. There's definitely yeah. a, a sense of that that um, uh, the, the British were a little bit um, cautious when it comes to selling, um, and. And, and even if anything kind of slightly, you know, you'll, you'll hear it often in conversation. If anything kind of, is, uh, people will say, oh, that's a, that's a bit American or it's a kind of, you know, as it being a bit sort of brash in its approach or a bit kind of uh, um, salesy. But that, I, th I think that's to our own, to our own detriment, really. Uh, and I think one of the things that I've gotten from running, pra running my own practice is, un is understanding that actually I'm a salesperson first in a lot of ways. Um, I'm in the business of architecture, like, you're, you know, you're, you're, like the name of your show. Uh, and that's my principal jo or job is to actually is to sell my services, is to, is to sell architecture. And then we can go into all the lovely design philosophies and ethos and all the stuff that we've trained so um, to develop. But when, when we were speaking last time, um, I was recounting of how I was, when I was working at Richard Rogers, his kind of first rule of architecture was win the job. Um, because without the job, without the client, there is no architecture. Um, I mean, obviously, there's, there is the world of you can be your own client or you can go off into the kind of more academic world where you're just doing purely conceptual ideas. Um, but that's a, that's, a kind of, that's a different strain of architecture in the world, in a, in a way. It's a part of the, a different it's part of the sphere. But generally, yeah, win, win the job and that's when we can start practicing. Well, I mean, that's a, and that's a pretty awesome realization. Um, interestingly enough, you know, over here in the United States, we still, if you look at business in general, sure, a lot of businesses are very business focused and they realize it's their job to sell. Um, you know, there's a lot of great entrepreneurial stuff going on here in the U.S. However, uh, with architects, I would say that that's generally not the case. And we still, so if you have a spectrum of people who like to, you know, who are really salesy, so to speak, in terms of their professions and their jobs. On one extreme, you might have the used car salesman who's out there just trying to pressure everyone into buying and just makes everyone feel sleazy and dirty. On one extreme, right? On the other extreme, you have, you know, the socialites who wouldn't dare even mention the word marketing or sales 
uh, in what they're doing. I think that, you know, definitely over here, architects are much more towards the non-selling side of the spectrum. We yes. like to see ourselves as sort of like you described as they do in, in, uh, in the UK. Yeah, no, it, it, exactly. And they, the sort of the art of selling architectural services is not one of kind of, uh, um, crass advertising or being quite like that. It is very much one of being, uh, positioning yourself as an expert uh, and one of educating people and kind of indirectly, um, you know, just in your, your, your being, your expertise, your knowledge, uh, and being able to share that with people um, is that's the kind of indirect way of, of, of gently grooming clients in a way. Yeah, and I think you, you hit it right on the head when your description of forming those relationships when you gave the example of talking to the tailor, how it takes multiple times. I mean, you're, you're building a real relationship there, and that's yeah. really how, you know, if you're an architect, that's how you're going to get your best work. Yeah, exactly. And, and the you know, this idea of, of selling is really one of just, it's the relationship. It is based on those human relationships um, and you being generally interested in the other person, what can I do for you? Um, who are you? You know, what's, what's making you, what's making you take a genuine interest? Um, and being able to e extract that and communicate it. Um, and then you become an asset. There's a relationship there. There's a trust there, which means that paves the way for a collaboration. Uh, and when that relationship is kind of intact, um, and there's a strong foundation there, there's an intimacy that begins to blossom uh, between you and the clients and you can start to be a little bit more creative and a little bit more, the design starts to, to happen more naturally rather than, rather than just a kind of, uh, more of a black and white service um, industry where, you know, your client asks you for A and you give them A or, you know, you give them A, but a little bit of A, a plus as such. Um, but when there's that, the, the more the relationship is there, the more um, different directions can happen and the more that it becomes a collaborative effort. You're very eloquent, Ryan. You're, you're, you may uh, displace me as the business of architecture host here. <laughs> the next, the next Charlie know. Rose. <laughs> Thank you. So, hey, Ryan, just let us know. Tell us, tell our listeners a little bit about your background, a little bit about who you are so they have some, some frame of reference. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm an architect. I've studied in London my entire sort of architectural career. Um, I started studying about 2000 um, and I studied at the Bartlett, which is one of London's top schools. Um, and I'm very sort of, it was the most phenomenal experience and quite transformational really. And just understanding what architecture is. Um, I was, I was at the school recently, um, for the end of year show and it just it just brings back this incredible energy of people speculating playing up with ideas what is architecture what does it mean to be an architect in contemporary society so that kind of education was just it kind of ripped my brain opened and put a whole lot of new stuff into it and and actually now running in my own business that kind of creative fertile almost avant-garde environment um, is incredibly good for entrepreneurial thinking. This kind of holistic, systemic way that we look at the world as an architect and kind of go into free throw and be very creative is, is ideal for business. It's ideal for making those kind of links with networks and stuff. So I spent, you know, eight years, whatever it was, studying at, uh, at the Bartlett, did all my professional qualifications at Cambridge University. Um, and, you know, in the UK, when we sort of halfway after you've done your sort of bachelors as it were I went and worked for um, a, an architect called Peter Barbers uh, and he does a lot of very civic um, conscious projects working on homeless hostels um, social housing um, and he had a very very sort of beautiful understanding of this reciprocal nature between people uh, and the city uh, and how a kind of people are informed by their building and they then go on to inform and create the buildings and it's this kind of circular relationship. Um, so I was very lucky to, to do that and then went back to the Bartlett, did professional examinations, got qualified uh, and then started working at Grimshaw um, who did the Eden project and they do lots of airport stuff uh, and I was working on airports mainly which is kind of uh, after after being in the Bartlett where you're kind of doing very avant-garde 
crazy conceptual um, thinking to go thrown straight into the hard logistical world of airport planning um, and working out luggage um, racks and all that, all this kind of stuff was really, I mean, it was fascinating in one sense. It was very difficult, um, but it was also it's given me a very good background now in, you know, understanding the art of the diagram, um, in being very good at working with logistical problems and having a very strict methodology for being able to approach any problem, um, which was just kind of underpins all of that kind of creative thinking that you were kind of, was, that was being nurtured through university. So after Grimshaw, uh, I went to work for Richard Rogers and was there for about three years uh, and primarily was working on, again, a kind of innovative housing system where we were using pre-manufactured SIPS panels um, to produce uh, sort of housing, housing solutions across East London um, and, you know, build these kind of almost like flat pack housing, essentially. So it was doing a lot of that kind of housing. There's a lot of competition work that I worked on. So doing all that kind of stuff. And I was also uh, involved in other sort of larger scale logistical pro projects like a whiskey distillery and those kinds of things. So it was a very large scale of work. Um, and I found Richard Rogers was one of these environments where it's, like, it's kind of like an architect's dream in a lot of ways. They treat you amazingly well. Uh, you're fed well. Uh, they take you on holiday. Richard Rogers is kind of, a, you know, a very inspiring leader. He's one of these guys that he's not kind of kept away from the rest of the architectural um, team. He's there on the floor. He comes and sits down next to you and kind of says, right, what are you, what are you looking at? What are you doing? Um, and very enrolling leader. So when he kind of says, you can, why don't you try this or do that? You're like, yeah, let's, let's go and... Let's go and do that. And I loved the way that he orchestrated his entire office. I thought it was wonderful. And he really was. He was like a conductor. Um, and he was, in his very sort of social nature, um, and his all, you know, the architecture that he provides is all about creating social spaces, creating um, places for people to meet each other. Um, very similar to that, what I was talking about with Peter Barber, that reciprocal relationship. Um, and that's the way he ran his practice, a uh, very, very sort of a charismatic, um, very human leader in that aspect. Uh, and obviously the, the way that the, the, the company is set up, it's set up like a charity and they kind of match a lot of the profits that they make and they make these donations. Um, and next door to his practice, he has a restaurant called The Day, um, which is a Michelin style restaurant where obviously lots of their clients go and get wined and dined and it's a fantastic arena for making new connections and making uh, talking to new clients uh, and again just sort of watching this kind of wonderful process of of people of new people being introduced to other people uh, this kind of leadership style and the entire environment that was set up at, at rogers was you know that was very very inspiring and it was one of these places where you're kind of like you're either going to stay there for the rest of your life or not. Um, and for one reason or another, I ended up moving, moving on and was kind of like, I'm, you know, I want to have more client control. I want to be able to meet the clients and deal with people my, myself. Um, so as a young architect there, um, it is, it's, it's a very top-heavy place. Um, and I think, you know... I was itching to meet clients and kind of rather than be placed onto one aspect of a job, actually have um, more control and actually be able to see more of the process and be involved in the business of architecture, being involved in the winning of the work. Um, and I think at those kind of firms, that's a, that's a long, to get that kind of experience will take its, it takes its time. Um, so after working at Rogers, I made the decision and set up practice by myself. Um, I had a little bit of savings, um, which quickly evaporated way faster than I had could possibly have imagined, um, and decided to, yeah, basically just whatever kind of work would come my way was, the, was my first sort of reaction to it. Um, and I did a little bit of freelancing here and there um, and 
I was helping another architect, a friend of mine called Simon Hallian, who runs Shared Architecture, and he was been he was amazing. He was like one of my sort of mentors, uh, and he he helped me. I mean, he's been running his business for about seven eight years, um, and I kind of had was able to sit down with him and have long lunches, and him basically just detail everything that he's been doing and his processes, um, and the way that he's been winning work. Um, and he was able to sort of pass little jobs on to me and I was in a shared studio pace with, with him and another architect and so I was getting lots of my first gigs from basically bits of work that they didn't want um, and friends and family were all helping me out and you know kind of you know but it, it gets to a stage where you realize that's not gonna last too long um, and one of the, my first sort of ways of Realizing I need a proper pipeline, um, how do we begin to build this? Uh, and just because I like, you know, I like networking, I like meeting people, I'm quite a sociable person. Um, I think my dad suggested to me to go and try out B&I. Um, so that was, that was really one of the most kind of important business decisions that I've made was to uh, go to my local chapter. As we were discussing earlier, was it, it's quite lucky because I'm in, you know, I live. Liverpool Street, the heart of the financial district. Um, so I went along there, became a member, uh, and that really was very inspiring because, again, I was surrounded by all sorts of um, very experienced business people. Um, there's a guy there called Paul Roger who has his own graphic design agency, which has been running for 30 years. There's an insurance broker there, Andrew Thompson, who's had his company for five years. And just hearing these stories of how these businesses had grown and how they'd won clients uh, and the strategies that they had in place. And also just having a team of other professionals, um, lawyers, lawyers, to IFAs, accountants, um, and being able to ask questions in that weekly environment was, it was such a relief actually, it was such a relief. Um, and it felt kind of like a little surrogate office in a way rather than, I mean, as you know, being a sort of sole practitioner can be, it's pretty lonely at times. And you kind of need that. You need somebody else who's been through it just to sort of touch base with and, and, uh, and get a feel for. So through using the BNI structure and understanding the network, that's kind of uh, been one of my main sort of directions in, uh, in how to grow my own business is, is building those relationships and getting much more specific and having strategies for networking. Um, and obviously just kind of thinking back to how, how Richard Rogers was doing it um, and seeing that kind of that quite wonderful environment with this relationship with this with the River Cafe restaurant and his office and the architecture itself lending itself to social spaces, always having breakout areas for people to talk and having that kind of company culture, which was very much about conversation um, I was kind of very influenced like that by that and that's very much the sort of root of, of, of what the thinking hand studio is about you know here in the US Ryan um, a lot of architects especially sole practitioners at times feel squeezed on their fees if they're working with clients that aren't used to working with architects so especially in the residential space if you have uh, clients come in and they have a vision of what they want. They've never worked with an architect before, and they don't have really a clear picture of how much it costs to hire an architect. And so, what what ends up happening, you know, sort of couple that with the the uh, antitrust lawsuit that the AI went through back in the I think it was the '60s. You know, people are very cautious about fees, sharing fees, and it's resulted in what what I would say is sort of like a race to the bottom. A lot a lot of architects feel pressured to lower their fees otherwise they'll lose out on a job. I mean, I was reading an, an email the other day from an architect writing to me saying, you know, I'm desperate here. Um, I have like three clients that have beat me down to like 1% of construction cost. I'm losing money on these projects. I'm curious, um, you know, one of the things that, that makes it necessary to use an architect in the U.S. is that we do require a stamp for a certain building of a certain size. Now, for most residential projects, a stamp isn't required. So uh, in your case, if you were going to be doing, you know, a custom residence, um, you probably would not need to work with a registered architect, depending on what state you're in. Right. So there's that. Um, but do you find that similar kind of uh, price pressure in the UK in terms of, 
you yeah. know, certain people that will just cut their fees to try to get the job? Yes, yes. I mean, it's particularly at the lower end of the market, it's very, very competitive. As architects, we're competitive with the kind of all-in-one contractors that can bash out, you know, building regs, drawings in a week and uh, they can charge a third of what it is that you're charging. And from a client perspective, they don't really know what the difference is between your services and a contractor's. Lowering and reducing, uh, reducing, reducing fees to kind of, you know, win a job. Um, and actually, again, through BNI, I was introduced to a business coach um, who, and I've, I've done a lot of sort of, there was also, this, whilst I sort of set up practice, there was this whole sort of world of personal development that I was doing at the same time. Uh, and I got introduced to a guy called Johan Taft, who has actually worked with me on, on this very matter about reducing your fees and basically, no, don't do it. You know, be, we have our fees set at a certain rate. You know the kind of service that you're able to bring to a client. You know the value that you can bring as an architect. It's a long-term investment. Um, you're not just providing a black and white service. This is a, an investment for the future which will make the client money. So, and you've got to be confident in being able to, to, to say that. And a lot of the work that I've been doing with Johan actually was was around that area and also the kind of head trash that goes on that we might pick up from university, we pick up in the architectural industry. There's a lot of um, sort of head trash stories that run around about, you know, there is, there's a belief in the architectural industry that it's hard to make money and, um, and that architects don't get paid well. And if you've got that running in your head, that's what's going to happen. You're just going to live into that all the time. And it just undermines your, what, you, what it is that we do. Um, and it means that when a client starts to push for lower fees, that we will do it. We will, we will lower our fees. Um, so one of the things I've been doing with, with Johan, um, when I first speak with a client, when I first meet a client, I'm very upfront about my fees being expensive. Um, and if that's going to be a problem then it's quite all right for us to not continue the conversation. Um, and it's, it's, it's as upfront as that. It's very, very straightforward. Um, and, but also, you know, you, you getting in the position of you screen your clients because if, you're, if a client suddenly comes to you and the first thing they say is how much is it going to cost to do this, this is not a good way to start a conversation in the first place. Um, so you having your own set of screening criteria for clients that you're looking for that relationship you're looking for somebody who you can get to know intimately that you can that you can enjoy being around that you can go to their house and have a, a cup of coffee with them and enjoy talking and they respect and understand what it is that you do as an architect and uh, and you know they see you as an expert they don't see you as just somebody who's um, you know, just doing some drawings for them, just to draw up their ideas. That's the draw up ideas. It's it's a it's it's a it's a very valuable investment um, for people's for how people are going to live their lives in these buildings. Um, and again, it goes back to that 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 relationship that I was talking about the reciprocal relationship between buildings and people, and um, how that how that works. Uh, and you know, coming from a place where that's you know, inside of you, and you recognise it's a, it's one of these very, very deep human activities is making buildings, um, and it's not something that it's there's a lot of care, a lot of thought, and a lot of sacrifice as an architect to to kind of go through the process to be able to do it. And you know, we love what we do, we love it. It's that's what you know, it's so fulfilling, such a fulfilling activity to be involved in. Um, and that's that's massive value for a client, and you want to take a client on that on that journey, uh, and for them to see that that's what that's the service that we're providing. It's not just a quick, um, you know, do a few drawings, get it through planning, um, and, and and whip something up as fast as possible. There's a different story told. So, and again, a lot, you know, like I was saying. I've been doing with Johan in terms of the mindset and the mental stuff, the head trash and the stories um, uh, has been really, really important in, in kind of unpicking that and all the sort of things 
the neurosis that you might uh, pick up from university. Um, because as an architect, we are trained to work long hours into the night um, and there is this kind of hard graft about it. And that's not going to go away as such, but there's a mindset that accompanies that of, you know, we've got to, we've got to energy and effort into it. Um, and there's a kind of a little bit of a victim sob story that goes with it uh, at university. And most of us, when, for university, when you're doing these kind of long hours, um, it's often... A, it's not very productive, it's very stressful, um, and you know those kind of bad working habits can come through into practice, and you see lots of offices that have that kind of culture, um, and it's not particularly useful for anybody. Um, and if you take that into professional working life, um, there's a story going on that's accompanying that, and that kind of feeds into, I'm gonna lower my fees at, just because a client's upset. It happens all too often. Yeah. All too often. How, how are we doing with the signal, by the way? Um, your break, um, is it clear? You know, there have been a couple of pauses in terms of kind of breakups. Um, hopefully our listeners won't mind. I mean, um, you know, but I think we're getting pretty good bandwidth. It's just, uh, it pauses every now and then. But let, let's, let's finish up, Ryan. Um, let, us, let me know what do you have in mind for the interviews and, uh, you know, for the future. So I'm looking to talk with uh, a number of different architects, uh, mainly based in London. Um, I've been approaching uh, a number of different people. I, I, I want to talk to lots of new, new practices, new design practices. Um, so lots of my contemporaries have, to have started up practices. I've got um, a friend, Azad Khan, who I'd like, to, who I'd like to, for him to share his story. I went to university with him. Uh, we were in the same unit together, and he started up business um, straight, you know, straight out of university. I mean, he barely finished. Um, and last year, or this year, actually, he was in the shortlist, the last, the final six for the new Guggenheim Museum in Helsinki, which is, I mean, that's just it's phenomenal, brilliant, absolutely wonderful uh, mark. Uh, and there's lots of other kind of, you know, design uh, young design practices like that, maybe been around five, six years, to new practices that have just started up, to more mature um, London-based architects. I'd love to have a chat with Richard Rogers and for him to. Um, so we're so we'll see we'll see if we can get that to happen. That would be fantastic. Um, and I've been approaching other architects to get kind of just to hear the stories of um, how that they've how they've grown their businesses from inception right through to the sex. sex and I've also wanted to chat with um, some other architectural service providers. Uh, so I have a friend who works in uh, for Cairo Communications, which does is a PR company for architects, uh, and they they cater for a very niche sort of area of PR, which is just dealing with architects. So I think having a conversation with him will be incredibly insightful uh, around how architects, how we, you know, it's a very complex service that we provide um, and how do you know how do architects make themselves unique in such a kind of competitive market well i'm looking forward to it ryan excellent so am i should be very 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 exciting and that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture to get more resources about how you as an architect can run a rewarding business that is both fun flexible and profitable visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.